Hey everybody, and Tony here with a review of Leo Shanashek's Vets Makropoulos, known in English as the Makropoulos case, which was shown at the Wiener Staatsoper. The conductor was Jakob Ruscha. The production was done by Peter Stein. The set design was done by Ferdinand Wurgebauer. The costumes were done by Anna Maria Heinreich. The lights were done by Joachim Bart. The masks were done by Cecile Kretschmar. And the chorus master was Thomas Lang. Now, entering in this very prestigious opera house was just such a thrill. When I bought my ticket to see Vets Macropolis, I was totally blown away by everything, especially in terms of where this was located. It was such a very lively atmosphere. There was a lot going on, and it was just bustling with people going left and right, bustling with a lot of lights. And especially when I entered the main building, I was totally enthralled with the architecture, the history that this opera house had. And, well, there were some moments in which I felt like I wanted to, like, go back in time through a time machine and really relive of what these performances were like with the likes of, let's say, Gottlob Frick or Ingard Seyfried or Leonie Rezenek and many, many other performers who were very well known at the Wiener Staatsoper. Well, I'm not going to mince words here, but I actually agree with everyone who's went to this opera house that this is one of the finest opera houses I went to in pretty much all of Europe. This was absolutely fantastic and for those of you who haven't went to the Vienna Staatsoper yet then I really really recommend this opera house you will be blown away by the architecture and even by the performances themselves so let's get on to the main review of Vets Makropoulos now what I have seemed to notice about a lot of Leo Janaschek's works is that they involve women who go through a lot in their lives. Women who fight, who struggle, who fight against the norms of society, who have a lot of struggles with their lives in terms of their roles in society, in terms of their roles in the family, in terms of how they want to have a better life for themselves. With Yanufa, you have a conflict of morals, you have a conflict of norms of what seems to be acceptable and what seems to not be too acceptable in the peasant class, so to say, or in the rustic class. That would be a much better word. And then in Katya Kabanova, you have a young woman who is suffering under the cruelties of what society has thrown at her, especially considering the emotional abuse she has dealt with with her own domineering mother-in-law, the Kabanika. With the cunning little vixen, we have like youth and innocence, which are constantly being put into the test, also known in English as fate, which deals with stardom, based on what I know, and this in particular, Vets Makropoulos, which not only deals with stardom and fame, but also something that's very supernatural. This also involves the whole plot of the elixir of life, and especially in terms of eternity, how one wants to live forever, but finally realizes that there is a huge price to living for a very, very long time, as they feel that when you live for a very long time, you start to feel, feel very tired with the world. You start to feel rather frustrated with it. And this opera demonstrates it very well. What really makes this opera stand out is, like I said, its story. Unlike a lot of Janoszek's works, with the exception of The Cunning Little Vixen, which has a very fairy tale like feel, this opera also has a pretty supernatural feel in terms of the main character, Emilia Marti, who has a lot of aliases like Eugenia Montes and um, Elian McGregor, and of course, her original form, 
Elena Makropoulos. This is quite a very interesting opera because what makes it kind of supernatural is that it also involves this whole plot of the elixir of life and how Emilia or Elena was tested by this by her father, Hieronymus um, Macropoulos. So this opera is very interesting in terms of the many themes it has, but also this is an opera in which it is a star vehicle for a lot of dramatic sopranos who can pull off this very complex character well. We've had the likes of Anya Celia and Cheryl Barker, well, really putting their hearts, souls, and energy into this very interesting, very complex anti-heroine. And this role is also very challenging, not only in terms of theatricality, but also in terms of vocality as well. So I'll get to that type or that part more on the singers because I also want to talk further about this about this very interesting character known as Emily or Emilia Marti. But for now, I want to save this time to talk about the production, the singers, and the conducting itself. The production, I have to say, was absolutely gorgeous, using a lot of great colors and a lot of color schemes to really match each mood. And even the costumes were equally fabulous. This is definitely a very fine production, and this also has to be very absolutely absolutely excellent in terms of the lighting, especially in terms of the final act where it's all red in which we finally see that Emilia or Elena has decided to no longer live anymore since she's been living for over 300 years. So I'm not going to mince words here and just say that the, that the production and the costumes, the lighting, they were just all excellent. And now we get to the singers, the very part I am extremely excited to talk about. As I said before, Emilia Marti is a very complex character. Possibly one of the most complex characters in all of Janáček's operas and maybe even for from opera history. This type of character needs a very strong dramatic soprano and even a spinto soprano. Singers who have sung the likes of Chrysotemis, the Marshallin, Arabella, Abigail, Odabella, Leonora di Vargas, the Trovatore Leonora, many from La Fanchula del Vest, Valentin from Les Huguenots, and to some extent Madame Lidouane from Le Dialogue de Camelite have sung this character. Even a lot of veteran sopranos like Anya Celia flock to sing this very interesting character. And when I heard the great lyric dramatic coloratura soprano Laura Aiken was going to sing this, I was quite skeptical at first because this role is usually the providence of a lot of spinto and dramatic sopranos. And I'm kind of wondering, what's a lyric dramatic coloratura soprano like Laura Aiken doing singing this role? I had my doubts because I really love her in roles like Constanza and Lulu. And I am still hoping that one day her Queen of the Night will be released onto YouTube because I could tell that she was also very well known in that role as well. Safe to say, she did a very fabulous job as this very iconic Janáček character. She surprised me in more ways than one. She had a very, very fine technique with her voice. She naturally sang her parts very well. And as an actress, she was consummate. She totally threw herself into this character, making her very multidimensional, 
giving her her coldness, her layers, and every moment in the opera, you see layer after layer after layer after layer of Elena Macropoulos or Emilia Marti. She is totally, well, fabulous and intriguing and fascinating in this role. She surprised me in more ways than one, and I'm absolutely very happy to have seen Madame Aiken attempt this role really well, using all of her fine acting chops, her flair for drama, her flair for the text, and her flair for such fine musicality and such fine theatricality. So, bravo to you, Madame Aiken. You were absolutely excellent in this role. I really am surprised that this is a role that you've attempted and you have done very well. Brava to you. And as I said, she's absolutely excellent all throughout. She really gave her whole in this role, giving her her emotions, her her insecurities, and a lot of her moments where she feels unprotected or insecure or feels like something's about to go up. She was excellent. I'm not mincing words here. She was absolutely excellent. Singing the role of one of her lovers, Albert Gregor, who is actually her, well, great-great-grandson, was Ludovic Ludha, a tenor that I've never really heard before, but as I read his biography, I was quite fascinated with the repertoire he used to sing. He used to sing the likes of La Boheme and Romeo and Juliette, and a lot of the full lyric and some occasion spinto tenor repertoire. With Albert Gregor, you do need a strong spinto or dramatic or even held in tenor to really pull this off very well, as he also needs to have very fine acting chops. With Ludovic Ludha, I have to say, he was wonderful in this role. He had a very fine voice. His voice was clear. It was resonant. It was piercing. And it was so full of fine colors and it was just a cascade, a pure cascade of wonderful sounds, wonderful tones that I automatically felt just so enthralled by seeing this tenor. He was in his A game and he was playing off of Madame Aiken very well. Their chemistry was absolutely superb and I could really tell that he also had a great ball with this role. Singing the role of the lawyer, Vitek, was the wonderful German character slash light lyric tenor, Thomas Ebenstein. The thing about Vitek is that he needs a, a full lyric tenor, or even a character tenor, or even at times a spinto tenor, who can be able to act and sing very well. With Thomas Ebenstein, he does a very great job with this role. Of course, I do expect a slightly meatier voice, but with Mr. Ebenstein in this role, he sang his role very fabulously, and he acted his role very well, not going over the top and not uh, being too wooden either. He was a fine actor and an equally fine singer. Singing the role of Christina, or Krista, was the wonderful Russian lyric mezzo-soprano Margarita Gritskova. The thing about Christina is that unlike Emilia, in which she needs a spinto or dramatic soprano voice, Christina needs a more lyrical voice. At times, high lyric mezzos even flock to sing this ingenue of a character. And unlike Emilia Marti, who is a prima donna, Christina is mainly a seconda donna or even that of an ingenue. With Margarita Gritskova, she really poured her heart and soul into this role with such a very fine voice, a very fine technique, and 
really great acting chops and an equally darling stage presence, I was hooked. I was totally hooked with this fabulous young lyric mezzo. I've only heard her name a couple of times and I was kind of curious of, as to how she sounded like. I did see that there was a lot of buzz of her on her saying that she's been singing in a lot of European opera houses and let me just tell you, it was an absolutely wonderful first impression I got to hear from her voice and her interpretation and her portrayal of this ingenue character. Saying the role of Yaroslav Prusch was the grand German dramatic baritone Markus Makvat. Now, this role calls for a dramatic baritone who specialized in the likes of Verdi, Wagner, Puccini, and a lot of other composers that require a great dramatic baritone. With Markus Markvart, he had a very strong stage presence. He was in top form with his voice. He had a very resonant and rich voice as well. His stage presence, like I said, was very strong and he pretty much was brilliant. He had such charisma and such flair that I was totally hooked. I was on the edge of my seat every single time he was on stage. Seeing the role of his son, Yannick, was the Mexican lyric tenor Carlos Osuna. Now, Yannick does call for a full lyric and in, at times a spinto tenor voice or even a dramatic tenor voice. With Carlos Osuna, he is just gorgeous with his voice. How he sings and how he manages to portray this extremely thankless character was so well done. I was totally hooked when I saw him on stage. He had a very fine presence. He was quite a gentleman as well. And he was just so outstanding in such a very thankless character. Which is no surprise because Carlos Osuna also sang a lot of lyric tenor roles in a lot of European opera houses. In the Wiener Staatsoper, he also does specialize in the in the compromario roles or even some of the character roles as well. But hearing him as Yannick was an absolute treat. Singing the role of Dr. Colenati was the wonderful Austrian bass baritone slash basso Wolfgang Bankel. Now I have seen or excuse me heard this gentleman in such roles like like let's say the Grand Inquisitor and Leporello. This gentleman is very versatile in a lot of the roles that he's singing like Leporello, the Grand Inquisitor, Rocco, Klingzor, Alberich, Monterone, Papageno, Zarastro, and The Speaker, and many, many, many other roles. He's extremely versatile in whatever repertoire he's given, whether they be the comic roles, the basso buffo roles, or the dramatic bass baritone, or even, in some extent, the basso cantante and basso profondo roles. He has an excellent instrument, giving such a interesting portrayal of this character role. He has a very fine and rich voice. He has kind of a loving stage presence, yet equally as powerful and strong. And I was totally hooked every time he was on stage. His voice was a magnificent cascade of sound, which is so burnished and just full of richness and roundness, and at times it can be cavernous. As a very fine quality that I have to say, he was just excellent in this role. And then in the role of the cleaning lady was the fabulous mezzo contralto Aura Tvarovska, who has a very fine voice and really makes great use of this extremely thankless character. Then seeing the role of the character role of Hauk Schendorf, which is also a calling card for a lot of character tenors, was the legendary 
Heinz Zednik, who is extremely well known in the likes of Mime and Loge from Das Rheingold, Mime from Siegfried and Monostatos from The Magic Flute, even Falzaki from Der Rosenkavalier. The thing about Hauk Schendorf is that he needs a very great character tenor. This has been a calling card for a lot of character tenors like Nigel Robson and Robert Teer. Now, what really makes this character role quite thankless is that, well, he's got a lot of character and he has to have a pretty great sing as well. And, well, there are times that he has to also, like, portray himself to be kind of loony in the head. That would be kind of the right word for this thankless character. But still, it's been quite the joy for a lot of character tenors to sing. With Heinz Sednik, I'm still rather surprised that he's still singing, considering that he's, like, currently 75. He still has a very fine voice, but more than anything... He has maintained his acting chops, which he's very well known for. I like him in roles like Mime and uh, excuse me, Monostatos and even Falzaki and many, many, many other character tenor roles. And he's excellent in this role. He's excellent in terms of his acting. And I'm still quite astounded of how, of how clear and kind of, well, character sounding his voice still is, even to this very day. I'm totally speechless that this guy is still singing. But still, in all fairness, he does a very wonderful job. And then with Marcus Peltz as the, the machinist, or the one in charge of the machines, he's, he's actually great as well. So overall, this was definitely a great evening for all the singers giving out such fine performances, but the biggest star was none other than Laura Aiken. Like I said, I was pleasantly surprised to see her in this role. I didn't know she could make it at first, but after witnessing her in this role, I was totally amazed, blown away, and well, she deserved the biggest round of applause from the audience. And the conducting done by Jakob Rusha was just so well done. So overall, wow. For a third performance of this opera, I was very impressed. Because, well, I forgot to mention this. This opera premiered on the 13th of this month, meaning that it aired like five days ago. But still, this was a very excellent evening for all the singers. I really enjoyed every single one of them and they deserved the hugest round of applause that they could ever get. Especially Laura Aiken, who led such a really long and interesting career from singing the very lyric coloratura roles of Cerbinetta, to the more dramatic color to her roles like the Queen of the Night and Aitra, Marguerite de Valois, Lucia Ashton, and Semiramide, to singing a more spinto and dramatic role like Emilia Marti. This is pretty much a rarity for a lot of dramatic coloratura sopranos to attempt this role, let alone even sing it. But Madame Aiken was just so awesome. I know that you're watching this, Laura, and I really have to say, I know I hate sounding like a broken record, that you were absolutely awesome. Well, that's all for now. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for a review of Richard Strauss's Der Rosenkavalier. I would have loved to review La Boheme at the Volksoper Wien, but, well... Schedule changes happen, and I've been always wanting to see Rosen Cavalier for some time. So until then, I wish you all a good night, and I hope you all have a very happy holidays.